very awkward if we hadn't recorded. All right, uh, here we go. Three, two, one. Welcome to the Off the Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. Oh, and I'm Paul. I'm joining the guys. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Appreciate that. Nice, nice to be with you guys. I'm Paul Schmucker of Everyday Driver co-host. And uh, thank you guys for having me on. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Uh, real quick, this is our podcast about anything and everything off-road. As always, we're socially distant because it's literally the only way we can make the show. I'm in the Midwest. Ross is in the Northeast. And Paul's in Utah. Utah has a lot of snow. Yeah. It, oh, continuing man. Too. You guys got clobbered. Yeah, and we're supposed to get 10 more inches this week. That's more oh, than we had gosh. here. We yeah. had less than that all winter here, which is... Let's put it this way. The ski resorts are open until April 23rd now. Oh, oh man. my gosh. Yeah. That's a good thing yeah. for you guys, though. You like skiing. We love skiing. Yeah, for sure. So yeah. that's a good thing. And and you guys are up in Park City, right? Up in Park City, for sure. Yep. Okay. Yep. So my best friend, since I've known since the first grade, and I'm in my 40s now, so it's been a hot minute. Uh, he lives in... He lives south... south east side of salt lake so uh he and i were talking a little bit ago and he's like yeah it's like once in a 40 year winter up here right now and i was like oh okay yeah and they have less snow down where he is right we're, we're about <laughs> two thousand feet higher elevation than he is so we're we're just i still have more than seven feet of snow in my front yard what oh my gosh yeah it's seven over my head feet yeah it's over my head now that that's all accumulated from the snow blower clearing the driveway right, right. But yeah still, constantly over time yeah my god it's, it's a lot <laughs> So that's, we're, that's madness. Yeah, I just <laughs> yeah. You live in the ag- land of uh, of mandatory snow tires. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Here it's it's uh it's like I guess people consider it optional, but I don't know. It's, it's crazy. It's we find people now. in Salt Lake they don't get snow tires, don't get winter tires, and we're just scratching our heads. Going, what are you? What are you thinking? Did you see the video of the guy in the TJ Wrangler in uh in Big Bear in Cal in yeah in California? That was trying to get out of a traffic jam. And I don't know if he was on like bald all terrains, but he basically just like pirouetted down a hill into cars. It was like bowling oh, no. balls or pinball. It was hysterical. That's horrible. From, you oh, know, gosh. hysterical from afar. <laughs> I, <laughs> hysterical I see video. lots of video. Yeah. <laughs> I see lots of videos out of Portland. Like once they get snow where people are just like, oh, I can handle this. And like, I, I'm sure I've told on the show before, but years ago, I've got I had a pickup trip- truck. I've got all the yes. pride. Yes. Like, no, that still doesn't matter. I saw <laughs> snow chains on the wrong set of tires. <laughs> oh, good. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. And I did it all on a front wheel drive minivan in Portland years ago. It was fantastic. Oh, awesome. Boy. Awesome. Oh, boy. <sighs> okay, Paul or Paul Ross. Oh, <laughs> my. My head's a little frazzled tonight. That's not a good start to the show. You just got back uh, from a trip. So you're good. You're still well, playing I, mental well, catch up. Yeah. And you're still well, playing mental catch up from sequoia hell so yeah we'll we'll go through my update here in a second where 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 do you want to start i have one i mean we talked about all the fun stuff last night in press car land last Uh, week last week yes last week because (laughs) last night's recording yeah the m340i that's coming tomorrow is not the one that car and driver had it is a rear wheel drive car much to my excitement a non x drive as far as i can tell from the window sticker and that's all I have to say about press car land. So other than that, um, I guess current me, based on when this comes out, may or may not have installed CarPlay in the Lexus. Okay. And the accessorized remote start kit is still functioning perfectly, which is awesome. a delight because we actually had a couple days low freezing, which uh, which is kind of a, you know, <laughs> nice mid-march treat before it gets warm so yeah that's all i got you got much, sweet much deeper i'm i'm stuff i'm literally going about. i'm going to my spreadsheet right now that i keep a vehicle yeah. maintenance so, to Paul, so, so yeah this just got back from a trip to colorado with his family and they took their nice. suburban and their sequoia Oh, and nice. Both, both vehicles so it, decided it, it, that this would be the trip on which to uh, fight back. What well, year the, vehicles are those, Chris? So Supposedly. the the Suburban is a 2017, um, okay. and it, it was a, a premier trim level. And so it's got the Magna Ride. And, and to be honest, like, it's great at putting down highway miles. Like, it yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then our other vehicle that we took is a 2008 Sequoia. Um, it's okay. a Platinum. 
Um, but I've swapped on some Tundra TRD wheels. Um, and so it looks a little skids, tougher. Sliders. Well, yeah, now it's got skids and sliders on it um, in and preparation for going to Moab. So yes. that, that is coming up soon. Nice. Um, You're coming out to Utah. That's awesome. Yeah. like At the time um, that this podcast comes out, you will be. In, I will be in Utah. In Utah actually, yeah. I oh, think. Excellent. Or at least on the way out there. Yes. Um, You'll be fighting the Jeeps at Moab Easter Jeeps Park. Yes. That's um, right. Are and, you here around that time, around the, the safari? It is. Uh, we're there a little before it. And then I think we're vacating the Moab area as the full Easter Jeep weekend goes into full effect. That's we'll, probably we'll head down towards Capitol Reef, I think. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, Beautiful down there. At least, at least that's the synopsis I've seen. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Nissan's I did also get the email on. recently that said like accurate routes are subject to change based on weather right now. And I was like, interesting. That'll be, yeah. yeah. Makes, makes that recovery gear uh, addition be a little more important if we're, we're going to have some weather involved stuff, but mm -hmm. on the way back from Colorado with the Sequoia, it check engine light went on VSCs flashing traction controls, flashing four lows flashing. Fantastic. Um, no, got a little, you want. yeah, the, the, Better coming the, back and going. Yeah, the mountain passes and and stopping a six thousand almost six thousand pound vehicle got to the rotors a little bit, so there was some lunging and some shaking, <laughs> and so it and the truck has two hundred and fourteen thousand miles on it. It's a two thousand eight, like it yeah. it's got some some life that's lived, and so we took it in uh, and they based the we took it into a dealer, which is always you know that's going to be painful. Yeah. Yes, I know, but. I needed to get things done quickly and accurately and well. And then I wanted to yell at somebody if something goes wrong. So that's why I went to my dealer. <laughs> <laughs> you hadn't that's thought about fair. that one, had you? <laughs> no, no, you, you can always, you know. You, you can't scout. really go yell at your local auto guy if uh, he's because sure. it's just him. So mm -hmm. anyway, check engine light was called because the original radiator cap decided to disassemble itself. Oh, um, spring sick. pop loose. Yeah. And so over time, we were losing coolant. Um, no drips were seen, but we were burning off coolant. Uh, so new radiator cap, uh, then they refilled the cooling system. Didn't flush it, just refilled it. We flushed power steering though, um, and then did flush front diff, rear diff transfer case for the heck of it, basically. Mm -hmm. um, flushed brake fluid. Hadn't done that yeah. since owning the vehicle. Um, and we've had it for uh, three years solid now. So um, it hasn't always been with us, but for the three years we've had it, we hadn't done any of the stuff before. Um, and then we were able to resurface all of all four rotors, um, okay. get get rid of the warping there. Um, That'll and then buy I, you some time, but it's not a forever. Right. It's not a forever, but it buys me time. Installed the front springs that I had acquired. Um, mm -hmm. There is a Toyota dealer in Virginia that my Land Cruiser and I buddies friends have figured out they are the cheapest Toyota OEM parts because really? come to find out parts is not a standard price at all dealers no specifically it, Toyota dealers it used to be the cheapest Toyota parts dealer in the country it used to be the one in your town right it's not because <laughs> I I, know. I I shop my guys and I'm even paying for shipping it's still cheaper so hmm. that's nuts to me. That's yeah. impressive. Wow. That's right. Good to know because I need wow. I need a couple things. Cool. Cool. So got new uh, front springs alignment, and we replaced spark plugs as well. Um, we kind of did like a full service. Um, we're also, I don't know if he's up here or not. We're also going to probably gift it to our oldest son soon this summer for good him for to drive. Yep. And so it was kind of like let's do all of the things that we need to do now kind of thing to get another hundred K out of it. Mm -hmm. um, if we get over 300,000 miles with this truck, it would be very impressive for us. Um, so when but, things go wrong next time, it will be his responsibility. Yes and no. He'll still yeah. get the bill. Chris will still get the bill. Though. Yeah. That's yeah. Fair. Like it's, I'll, I'll still pay the dad tax. Like that's, yeah. that's not going no away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So that being said, other than like, I'm waiting on one more piece to come in the mail. Um, for some recovery equipment uh, and I think I'm ready to go like it's cool. it's getting exciting things I've done I've practiced the layout in the vehicle a couple times now actually no there's two things left to come in the mail once the once still that power supply that I, I ordered oh, yeah. I talked about on last week's show uh, and then uh, the recovery point that I'm mm -hmm. installing on the rear of the vehicle um, do is you still coming. have a front recovery point I have two front hooks hooks underneath yeah from the frame yeah okay good yep 
in big bolts into the frame. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just checking. Which they're probably similar to what the Land Cruiser ones were, which doesn't make a hundred. That can't quite be the case because Land Cruisers came over on boats. Mm -hmm. So the ones on the fronts were actually tie downs for the mm -hmm. ships. Mm -hmm. um, Sequoias were made here in the U.S. So they wouldn't be using this to tie down on boats. So um, I do think they are yeah. front recovery points. So yes. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. Nice. You guys hitting arches while you're down there? Um, I don't think so. Um, the two trails I've heard were Seven Mile Rim and Devil's Racetrack. Okay. Oh, you're on Seven Mile Rim. Fair hmm. enough. Is that the one? I think so. Fair enough. I yeah. have not spent enough time down there. Every time we go through it, we're of course in sports cars, so. Yes, you know, not as much <laughs> off-roading that we do, but I'd, I'd love to explore arches. Personally, I want to get down there more. And then, of course, the mountain biking, too. You know, even in February, yeah. it's a little bit warmer in southern Utah. So we want to go down there and just, yeah, cruise around and hang out, go mountain biking. The off-roading looks amazing, but the mountain biking looks even crazier. Like, I cannot imagine what the drops feel like <laughs> when you're that close oh, to yeah. them. yeah. Exactly. There's a lot. And there's uh, various, uh, you know, bike shows that pop up down there and you can go down and test out mountain bikes and test out new gear and that kind of thing, which is pretty cool. Interesting. So haven't been down I'm, there. It's just always a schedule issue, you know. I'm, I'm going for my favorite mountain biking trail Moab uh, image right now. Oh, I know from, which one you're going to show. It's, it's Portal. It's insane. Like this. That is not for me. No, <laughs> it's not for me either. Uh, I'm, I, I, I've, met a gentleman who uh routinely is near and can see people going up and down portal and he says you'll see four go up and three come down i don't even want to hike on that trail much no, less neither. <laughs> i'd be okay hiking that but on a bike the closest i want to get is watching it on youtube unless yeah. you have mandatory parachutes right unless you're yeah, right. yes oops i'm base jumping <laughs> Uh, oops, I don't know if there's enough clearance. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, hey, we're mountain biking. Oh my gosh! Suddenly, oh, I'm base man. jumping. Okay, no, no, no thank you. No, thank you. Yeah, yeah not for me. Yeah, not for me. Portal's definitely a little intense. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. yeah. Occasionally, I find myself on rabbit holes of um, cliffhanger. You, you ever see videos of cliffhanger? No. The, I oh, Chris, pull up a picture of the of the famous cliffhanger obstacle. It is. It's, um, it looks like that, but you're hanging a jeep like just next to the, you know, like three thousand foot ledge. It's silly. This, it's just like <laughs> this one says it's a thousand foot ledge just thousand? right next to the jeep. Yeah, thousand's good enough for me. I'd prefer just. It <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's 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 a so good drop, huh? Yep, yep. It's uh, that, that it, looks it's like there. a postcard that I'd like to receive and not be there. <laughs> yes, a hundred percent. Yep, yep. And there's That's no winch points, nuts. so if you get hung up coming back and you're in the lead vehicle, you are SOL. <laughs> <laughs> Is there so, a trail yeah. called SOL anywhere in? Ooh, this area? there's a trail called SOB at one of my local places in Pennsylvania. Okay, all right. So close enough. Right. I mean, it's appropriately gnarly, but you know. You didn't, I didn't return a Google search there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Must just, be inherent. Must just be assumed every time you go out. It's just yeah, sorry. It's out of luck. <laughs> yeah. That is actually a fun trail with a bonus line on a bypass that is an infamous door crusher. <laughs> so next time I'm there, I'll take some pictures because it's like you look at it and you, and you just know that the driver's side. Uh, the passenger side rear door is going into the rock. Ooh, those yeah. Utah pinstripes. <laughs> yeah. That's what we call those. Yeah. We Which call I'm hoping to avoid. <clears throat> hoping. Yeah. The truck's white. They won't show that much. Yeah. yeah. No. So anyways. Well, it, and we did talk about last time, like there's an F-250 in the group as well. So I shouldn't be, I won't be alone if I'm earning stripes, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Props to that guy though. That's, that's crazy. Anyways, Paul, let's talk about you. So you introduced yourself and mentioned you're from Everyday Driver. So why don't you give us what we like to always ask for, the quick elevator pitch and <laughs> background that led you to where you are in the auto industry now? Absolutely. Well, I sure appreciate you guys having me on. It's been a long time since I've talked to you. And yes. the, the show was really <laughs> conceived out of not when we conceived it almost 16 years ago. 
there wasn't the landscape of automotive journalism that there is today. Hmm. And both Todd and I were watching Top Gear and thinking that it was a travel channel with a car problem. And then there was <laughs> Todd Davis at yeah. Motor Week, who's been doing his thing for a long time. Yeah. But it really just seemed like a brochure. Todd has accurately described it as just the car magazine come to life, the brochure for the car. Yeah. And he comes from a filmmaking background and I come from a design background. And there wasn't any time anybody describes a car on camera about the styling, they use the word sleek. No, <laughs> not use the word sleek. And I thought, I want to get better descriptors than that. I want to describe why it appeals to you or why it doesn't. Let's talk about proportion and line and washouts and use some of the design terminology that I've learned uh, over the course of my design career. But uh, something that I actually have not shared ever, and that is the first job that I had out of design school. I worked for Kawasaki uh, down in Irvine, California, mm -hmm. and I thought I was really you know, open to more off-roading. And even though I do like it, of course, cars are my first love. And I fully admit I'm pavement guy. I'm, I'm putting that, <laughs> I know who I'm talking to. Yep, yep. Yeah. But I went to work for Kawasaki and started working on the designs for the mule. And right about then, oh. Polaris was doing uh, really what has become all the UTVs. Mm -hmm. But Kawasaki was working on concepts then. And I you know, rollover protection system. I was working on a, a dual rider ATV that was in lines. Mm -hmm. It was, of course, rider active with ROP system, rollover protection system. So I still oh, have all my so sketches, still have all the designs that I did, working mm -hmm. on uh, the mule, worked on jet skis, uh, a lot of cruiser bikes, but all the crotch rockets were kept very close to home in the Japanese market as far as the design, mm -hmm. the design language, what they were doing. But I was actually sent out to Utah. I was living in California, sent to Utah, and went on a an ATV ride from nice. Fillmore to Richfield. On and cowies? Uh, on, on ATVs. Uh, the, it wasn't the mule that you're showing there. It was just the okay. straight up. Uh, oh, my gosh. That thing's old. <laughs> Man. <that> thing... <laughs> I was working on versions way past that, but, you know, okay. suggested for the future, but still. Uh, <laughs> riding uh, this ATV and really enjoying myself, to be honest. I was out there with uh, some guys from Bureau of Land Management, and we were riding through, you know, all kinds of terrain, getting really understanding the rider active mentality. Mm -hmm. That is, I think when you're, even when you're off-roading in a vehicle, a car, you're still have, a, your mind switches to a rider active mentality mm -hmm. to place your wheels correctly. Yep. So I still feel that when we're doing reviews or doing any off-road, which I admit is minimal compared to what you guys are doing. <laughs> still, that's my headspace when I approach off-roading is the rider active vehicle and shifting weight and well, placing wheels properly. It's the same as a sports car on, on any road, really, but Certainly. especially Certainly. on an evolving road. So I was riding this ATV and getting very enthusiastic, and the trail took a sharp right turn. And I came in with way too much speed. <laughs> oh no. As he and did. I did eject the ATV. I left it. It <laughs> went out from under me off the oh. cliff about oh. four or 500 feet down. It, was, it wasn't a straight down, but it was a, a steep enough slope that you, know, you, you wouldn't stop. You'd hit a tree. Oh God. So I let that thing go. And it turned into $15 worth of scrap metal at the bottom of the canyon, which they had to go in from the other side to haul the mangled mess Jeez. of that thing out of there. Oh I jumped God. up the hill onto the trail and turned around and watched that thing flip up over the top of a Douglas fir and smash at the bottom of the canyon. Oh my gosh. So this is my experience with <laughs> ATVs. My God. As I was working on designing what has now become the entire UTV market, mm -hmm. which has absolutely exploded. And you see those things yeah. everywhere all over Moab. Of course, while you have a drink in hand, but I've seen families drink in hand and they come down something yeah. that is almost, un you can't do it. You can't accomplish it with, say, a Wrangler. Mm -hmm. And then they decide, well, let's go back up and do it again. Yeah, those things yeah. scamper. It, it's the, the technology and what those things can do is absolutely astounding. It's, it's been interesting to start my career there and then move more into vehicle design and then a lot of product design. And that's really what led me to talking about design uh, with Everyday Driver. And Todd and I were watching these shows and going, man, there's nothing for, you know, you, you see a Ferrari 
And you think I'll never be able to have that experience in my life because I can't afford that. What is right. something that is 74% as good to drive as a Ferrari, but something that I can afford? What's mm -hmm. out there? And what's that show? What does that look like? And so if you're driving a McLaren, if you're driving a Ferrari, if you're driving a Koenigsegg every day, you are an everyday driver. If you're driving an Accord or a Civic, the problem is that terminology, that name in most people's minds is synonymous with Accords and Civics and boring stuff. Not so. If you're driving a 911 every day, well, that is your everyday driver. Mm -hmm. And we embrace <laughs> that. So really, our, our point is about the pleasure and passion and like-minded people who love to drive. So people would ask us, hey, you guys seem to know something about cars. Would you go with me to the dealership and hold my hand so I don't feel like I'm getting suckered by the salesperson who's only been on the job for three weeks and mm -hmm. all they want to do is get a commission because they've been told by the GM that you can make a lot of money selling cars. You right. just have to say the right things and the people will just buy the car. And they felt yeah. suckered and Todd and I are going, an opportunity to crush some salespeople and scare them <laughs> off the regular route? Yep. Let's yep. do that. But how do we... How do we monetize that? And more importantly, how do we syndicate that to help other people? So that was our entire headspace with starting the show is that is when we're on camera, there's only one other person with us. And that is you watching. Mm -hmm. It's just me and you talking about the car. Forget about, you know, massive viewership. It's just about us discussing the car as if we were best friends. And that was our headspace. Todd and I would kind of talk to each other on camera as if we were having this discussion about cars, but ultimately we want to have you hear our opinions, think we're idiots. You like Todd, you hate, <laughs> you like me or you hate Todd. <laughs> or these guys don't know anything. They don't know what they're talking about, but ultimately we've kind of pricked you a little bit to make you form your own opinion. And you go drive that for yourself and you think, these guys are totally right or they're way off base. Mm -hmm. What I found for myself was, something else. That's what we love. And so that was the foundation of our own podcast because uh, we had joined Matt Farah. Uh, gosh, we've known him uh, since he had moved out from New York. And mm -hmm. he said, you guys should do a podcast. And we said, about what? What are we going to talk about? <laughs> because there's many podcasts. And, and what I like about you guys is that you're very focused and you know what you want to talk about and you know what the mm -hmm. show is about. Mm -hmm. Because when we were telling people 15 years ago, Everyday Driver, a show about cars, everybody has an opinion. Hey, you guys should do classics. You guys should right. do off-roaders. Right. You guys should do race <laughs> cars, you should, old cars, whatever. And it took us about a year to figure out what we were and what we were not. Where are our strengths? Where do we not have strengths? Where can we learn? But ultimately, we still wanted to help people find a car they love to drive, whether that's on pavement or off-road. Mm -hmm. But again, I admit we're not focused heavily on the off-road thing. That's my own personal where I'm coming from that has given me a fear of heights. <laughs> <laughs> Todd's a climber. I'm not into heights. I just am yeah. not. I'm I'd say that's a healthy fear. Like, yes, it's, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. very healthy fear, but also, <laughs> you know, an approach to understanding, you know what, I don't want to design bikes. I want to design things that are four wheeled, whether that's mm -hmm. the UTVs, the ATVs or cars. That's my first love bikes. There's a lot of people who love bikes. They are awesome. They're an incredible feeling of freedom. If bikes didn't exist today and somebody suggested, Hey, this 200 horsepower, two wheeled thing, do you think that would pass oh, God, legislation, no. federal legislation God, no. allowed? <laughs> no, they've been grandfathered in. They're just accepted. Yep. But, oh my gosh, these things exist. What a great feeling of freedom, but that's not me. And then we tie that to cars and we just want to help you find a great car that you love to drive. But let's turn that into a show where we can compare back to back the cars that we're talking about. Because if you say, well, where's that competitive car that, you know, it's it's easy to do the single you know, car videos, which mm -hmm. we do for our test drive channel. And that's just initial impressions. It's something new that's come out. That's just an initial thought about that car. But when we're doing a segment like hot hatches, or oh, I'm here's so a great close. example, Chris, you're showing all the 86s. <laughs> well, how does it compare to the prior generation? Is yeah. it better? Do you, do you like it more? Yes, the numbers are better. What do the numbers tell us? Right. Let's forget the numbers and drive the car as it is and for what the badge is. Let's drive Ferraris, let's drive the Porsches for the cars that they are. Maybe they're not as great as we think they are. Mm -hmm. Maybe they are. Let's 
try to really understand that from a comparison standpoint and put these cars together. But of course, that makes it hard to schedule cars all together all at once. And back to back seat time informs our commentary because it magnifies the car's strengths and weaknesses instantly. Yeah. We, can, we can tell we get out of that car and be like, oh, 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 that thing is so much better than this because of the reason. Mm -hmm. Or I can totally tell a difference. What were the engineers thinking? They claim this. It is nothing like that. This car is like that. That that's our entire headspace. And so again, mm -hmm. the the point of the show was really to help people and bring a community together of like-minded drivers. People just love to drive, love what cars do. That's mm -hmm. our entire headspace. Yeah, and you've definitely experienced and enjoyed that as the the trips that everyday driver puts on have morphed into a bigger. The wholesome <laughs> production well which and, we can't believe yeah yeah I, I, we're actually doing two trips this year two meetups in the u.s in addition to our overseas pilgrimage trip mm -hmm. and our utah meetup has sold out in 15 minutes which we're amazed oh by wow. and the pilgrimage trip is entirely sold out for june 2023 wow. and we just cool. introduced a colorado trip which is supposed to be more spouse friendly that's our entire mm -hmm. desires because you know who do you get to share this passion with I mean, Chris, you have Ross to talk to. Ross, you have Chris. You've got your audience. <laughs> but you we know do talk saying. a lot. We do talk a lot. Yeah, absolutely. But yep. and we also have meet, when you meet then. fans of your show and you meet audience members, you're off to the races. You, yeah, you're you suddenly bonding over this shared passion, and it's nothing. There's nothing quite like cars. Everybody on the planet has a relationship yep. to a car. Whether you love them, whether 100%. you hate them, I guarantee you've ridden or seen a car, ridden in or seen a car. Mm -hmm. And it is a universal sort of language. approach to it. I grew up with my dad's station wagon and I, you know, sat in back seats. Exactly. Here's a great example mm -hmm. of the cars that inspired mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. uh, that, I've always loved those Testarosas. Todd's always loved the E type. His dad had two Jaguar E types, unfortunately, sold them. But his dad, they, they were just cheap sports cars then. They aren't the right. hallowed thing they are now. Right. Right. Same with Testarosas. I mean, they were the, this exotic sports car, but now it's like, oh, a manual boxer, <laughs> v, you right. know, boxer 12 engine. Yep. Who yep. makes no that? Mm -hmm. You know, so yep. <laughs> I, yeah, we, we love talking about cars just like you guys do. And, and uh, when you meet like-minded enthusiasts, it just turns into this, like, let's go for a drive. Mm -hmm. Why not? And just going back to what you were saying earlier, I think where everyday driver excels the most is in the context of things, because like you said, Top Gear is best when it's a travel show involving cars. <laughs> it's like France. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's Bourdain. Sorry, going over the Milan Bridge. Motor, you know, um, <laughs> and like Motor Week is on the opposite end of the spectrum. Like you could also just read consumer reports, you know, mm -hmm. so that overlap of the Venn diagram is where you guys have really seemed to have found your home. And th that's what brings in people who might not try to experience either side of things. So yeah. it's interesting yeah, exactly. to hear that you're now doing spouse friendly trips because, <laughs> <laughs> because I can tell you there are, uh, there are some adventures that, that my spouse wants absolutely nothing to do with for sure and for there sure. are some that i could probably entice her to be a part of you know pending the baby has some desire to do it right i mean there's of course life yet, circumstances but... and you know we want you know uh, if <laughs> everybody to be able to bring their friend or their spouse or their significant other to be able to share what they love and mm -hmm. instead of going home and explaining it. I was on this cool trip with the guys and da, 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 da. Right. You're here with us and you're, exp you're experiencing, you may still not like it completely, but at least <laughs> it's something that has more for everybody and yep. you know, more inclusive. And, and that's what we want because it doesn't matter whether you know the Nissan Z car engine codes. We don't care. I don't care if you know all the generations of the Porsche 911. It doesn't matter. Mm. Silly questions are welcome were your people if you're just suddenly you've discovered like cars my brother-in-law is a great example he let yeah. the car thing lie dormant for years and he's rediscovered things 
with turbocharged Saab 900s. Amazing. Okay. I love this guy. That's, I love this guy. It, right? <laughs> so we're in. It's awesome. It's yeah. great. It doesn't get much nerdier than that. <laughs> My dad had a couple 900s that he uh, he did time distance, time speed distance rallies with. Mm. And uh, and famously, the exhaust <laughs> fell off pulling into a town at like midnight. But so yeah. the, the image I have up here is, is this the loudest video you guys ever made? The Escalade V versus an AMG 63? The, the AMG is not uh, that loud. That came, yeah, but, came in GT4 RS is... Okay unbelievably loud really yeah that the is intake surprising. is right next to your ear what's oh, inside it, cabin is loud what it, yeah that uh actual quarter panel rear window on that mm -hmm. cayman on the gt4 rs it's just a plastic scoop with a hose going to the intake Amazing. Oh. <laughs> it's a window on most caymans not on the gt4 rs but these two were pretty loud that escalade is <laughs> man Thank God for that thing. Thank the God cold... that they just decided to make it. Okay. We had Johnny Lieberman on the show and he told us, I was talking about how I was, I had a V coming for a week and he said, it is the loudest cold start you'll ever hear. And I was well, like, that's because no. it starts in sport mode. Yeah. It's like bullshit. No way. And I started, <laughs> I like, they dropped it off. I parked it. I let it sit overnight and I started it from inside my house and was like, I am going to get arrested. <laughs> like there's no way around this. My neighbors yeah. are going to call the cops. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, so that you've experienced cool. it then yourself. Uh, yeah, I had one for a week. It was a very loud, loud week. Loud, fast week. Yeah. Yes. Inefficient. I think I saw 7.8 miles per gallon for the week. Good for you. I only got down to 11. Ooh, Good really? <laughs> wow. Try harder. I should. <laughs> <laughs> We're celebrating well, how bad you can be right now. Yeah, <laughs> what yeah. an achievement. I, that's like a merit mm -hmm. badge or something, yep. isn't it? A lot of full throttle. It makes good noises. Excellent. Yep. Good for you. Yep. Press. So let, let's talk about um, some other stuff that you've driven recently. So you guys had the new Sequoia TRD Pro. We did, yes. Went to the launch for that a year ago and experienced that uh, minimally off-road. It was more of a <laughs> gravel parking lot than anything. Mm -hmm. So it really mm -hmm. didn't showcase the off-road capabilities of it. But you could certainly tell that they've engineered it for some serious abuse. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chris, from knowing what yours is like, you've, you beat on yours, I'm sure. Yeah, a little bit. And will yeah. next week. <laughs> this thing's ready to take it. And of course, built at the San Antonio truck plant and everything that they've learned, you, you can really tell the development that has gone into this. They could sell this in Texas alone, mm -hmm. just Texas. And they'd still make plenty of money on these things. They're that, quite astounding. What what struck me, so we just went out and back to Colorado and like every five seconds on 70, I was getting, I was either passing or being passed by a Sequoia. Interesting. And, hmm. and I mean, I'm very cognizant of Tahoe's, Yukon, Suburbans. There, it was like three to one Sequoias. Hmm. And I don't know what it was about that stretch of 70 but between like Idaho Springs out to Copper, they were everywhere. Interesting. That's weird. Yeah. Was there a precedent going on or something? <laughs> no. They, <laughs> well, it's the hard thing with the Sequoia is like, unless you get like take the time to see the headlights that they go by, like it's the entire second gen mm -hmm. is like what, 20 years almost? It's 08 uh, to 22. 08 to, yes. Yeah. These new ones are fast. They're, I mean, everybody's lamenting the disappearance of the V8. Do not lament. <laughs> the twin turbo v6 is faster it's got more po power and 584 pound feet of torque i believe it's Golly. insane it's a lot it's, it's a lot it's a heavier truck but yes it is so but 584 like that's an ev almost amount of torque applied yeah. to a truck yeah. like yeah that includes that that's their uh their i force combination with, with uh, <laughs> the sandwich motor between the engine and transmission yeah mm. it is that yeah mm. And that's wow. supposedly one of the only downsides to the new Sequoia is the packaging in the third row is semi-disastrous with the high tray for the battery and like the third See, row I'm okay with of... it. I'm totally okay with that. Really? That's such a designer thing because that tray fits in its lowest slot. And yes, there is a two and a half inch rise, but you put it up to notch one and the floor mm. becomes flat. It's just a taller mm. liftover. 
So yes, you can get that flat floor, but they sacrificed that. And the engineer was adamant that they those seats are not to be removed. So when they flop mm -hmm. forward, you can push them all the way forward. And you, then you can actually make a flat floor with that plastic board tray that they have. But then, okay, you get a little bit more out of the back end, you know, since it's mm -hmm. not a XL or EL, I guess, version. So you don't have the extra two and a half feet of cargo space. Right. It just went up instead. So hmm. I appreciate it because it's very much like designers trying to have their way, which I relate to. Okay. <laughs> so what is the biggest instance of designers making the push and having their own final say that you've seen? The lack of door handle on the Mustang Mach-E. Okay. Really? Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Growing up, your parents taught you, don't put your hands on the stove. Don't put your hands in the door. You're going to get your fingers smashed. Mm -hmm. Here's these designers who hate door handles and want a clean look. I, I know what's going through their heads. Let's just put a little button and the solenoid will kick it open. It's like a mm -hmm. hot rodding technique. Right. We'll right. just kick the door open. And yes, if you do it wrong or somebody actually throws their body weight against the door while you have your fingers in the, in the door seam, you're going to get your finger smashed. Right. Oh my God. Terrible I idea. Also, so is this, is this the front one? This little that is knob? the front. So you also have to push the button and it's the tiniest handle. It's like a 1971 Ferrari 375 GTB door handle. That was just, that was <laughs> yeah. like a can yeah. opener. That's the same size. And then you're supposed to stick your fingers in the back just so the designers, because anywhere on there, you put a giant ugly door handle. Yeah. It's going to ruin the design. Door designers hate door handles. Full stop. Well, the thing we always see with concept cars is like no mirrors, you yeah. know, huge wheels. It's stuff like that where it's, yes. it makes it look a certain way. And then in most instances, you don't even notice that it's there once the actual Well, car many comes times out. designers will be given carte blanche after they settle on the production version. Mm -hmm. And that is done and hard freeze locked and sent to tooling then they're, they have the ability to go nuts. Mm. What would you actually like this car to look like? That'll be the concept to get the public excited. So the worst offender in that instance is then Subaru, which has, you know, had all those crazy WRX and STI concepts. And then the car yes. comes out and it's like- But everybody's oh. just like, build them. Yeah, yes to yeah. that. Just build it and we're good. Mm. And we'll be, everything will be forgiven. And then they don't. Yep. What yeah. happens if it's like, I don't know, it snows or ices overnight in the Mustang Mach-E. You, you don't know. open your door? <laughs> that's what I Tesla's are having sure. that problem. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. a sweet looking WRX. Come on, Subaru. And no door handles. Clean. Uh, might have door handles. I mean, Those are stickers. Like they're, they're like Those Tesla door handles. They pop yeah, out or something. They're stickers. Yeah. <laughs> but the designers don't care about the tech behind them. They just, you know, there's there's just a little door handle there and however they work, do they pop out? I don't care, whatever. Do, are they going to be good in snow and ice? We don't care. Right. But we gave you the door handle shape. There you go. That's an engineering issue. Exactly. Throw it over the fence. <laughs> Toss it over the, <laughs> yeah. the wall. Right. <laughs> Until it's ping pong and then, yeah. you know, something comes out like the Mustang. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. So Yeah, it's mocky. The door handles, they're terrible. We're a terrible idea. Any other glaring instances of that? Gosh, that's the that's the one off the top of my head. But uh, okay. you know, little little things when you find you know just on any car, you're going, why why did they decide on that? Uh, mm -hmm. Lexus is actually a big offender of this because they'll have a theme down the side of the car, and they don't want to put a door handle that breaks that nice line, mm -hmm. so the door handles are misaligned. The rear door handle, like on the Lexus, uh, it's the new ES300, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think it's that, or it's, it's either the ES or the GS. The door handle is misaligned. I think it was yeah. the GS, actually. Okay. Just, just so you that can was preserve a... your nice shape, your nice shoulder. Stop it. Good looking car otherwise, though. I'll give them that. <laughs> GSF but... still looks good. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> High standards over there. A little <laughs> bloated, a little heavy looking, but you know. Yeah. Right. yeah. Fair. Oh, that's not, I got the wrong one. <laughs> I'm, I'm Googling so fast. It's not, they're all lined up. So it's not working for me. All good. Yeah. I, I love talking about design. And, uh, you know, like I was telling you guys about, uh, Todd came, comes from filmmaking. He worked for New Line Cinema for a decade. 
and was in post-production there and really sees the world through a filmmaker's eye. And we have him to thank. I, I tell people he's our secret weapon because the cars need to be in a setting. It's nice to yes. have a drag strip or an airport or the same corner every time. However, the, the setting really is important to the theme of the car too. That's, it's every mm -hmm. bit as important as the cars themselves. That's the harder way to go about doing the film though because mm -hmm. we do a lot of travel or we wait for the weather to clear or sometimes we'll just you know embrace whatever we've got. This is the vehicle in this environment. This is where we're shooting, this is today. So he really brings this filmmaker's perspective. And his big, the biggest thing that he says is the camera lies. We all know that the camera lies, right? <laughs> oh, yes, I mean, it absolutely it, does. It let's is. make it oh. lie. Let's go ahead and embrace that. And you don't know where this is being shot. You don't know that there's a dumpster right next to the photo of the car that I'm taking, but you just mm. see the scenery, whatever that is. Right. Yep. So let's embrace that in our filmmaking. And so we really mm. want to create something that's, experiential like you're right there you're traveling to the location with us you're you know kind of yep. along for the ride yep yeah the, i think uh, i found the lexus too the camera lies in off-roading did you find the door handle they're misaligned see the the body line and then yes. the front one's below yes how stupid is that <laughs> it's I'm glad stupid i chopped off the bottom half of the grill on my lexus yeah <laughs> <laughs> I see things like that and it drives me nuts. And then yeah, poorly exactly. executed shut lines because it's up to the designer to draw where those parts will meet. And usually it's sheet metal up against a urethane bumper, two mm -hmm. different materials. It's tough to control that because of the shrinkage rate of the urethane and the stamping of the sheet metal. But to get that perfectly right, when you see it on Hondas and Mazdas, you're like, wow, that looks really good. And mm -hmm. then a Buick comes along and you're going, what did you... Right. <laughs> Did the third grade class design the shut lines? Is this a joke? Is it April Fool's? Like what happened? I'm trying to think. I think there's a, a small Lexus crossover that has a horrible like bumper seam that they it's just it, that makes no sense whatsoever. There's Isn't something it? underneath at that point for either fastening or some sort of uh either a crumple zone. There's something under there mm -hmm. that forced the designer to make that decision. So that was a that was a a battle lost by the <laughs> It's one of those things though that if you know and once you see it you can't unsee it. Exactly right. Yep. Yoga right. pants that shouldn't be worn on people who shouldn't wear those yoga ah. pants like just because they fit doesn't mean you should wear them. <laughs> <laughs> what vehicle wears the yoga pants of the automotive world? Mm, that ooh, shouldn't gosh. wear those yoga pants. Uh, give me a minute to think about that ooh, one. I see I think Okay, I have. I, I think he already said it. I think it's a Buick. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> look, there, there is, there are extremely talented designers and engineers at GM. Sometimes the problem is just the bureaucracy, the layers of bureaucracy. Yeah. Mazda is a tiny company in comparison, and you see absolutely gorgeously executed surfaces and their associated mm -hmm. shut lines, because you can have a beautiful surface that's completely ruined by the shut line where the panels meet. It, you don't you don't see anything else but this terribly executed shut line. I admire the transitions because at the base of the A pillar, you have five surfaces coming together: the A pillar, the glass, the hood, whatever that theme is, and the body mm -hmm. side going up. It's absolutely exquisite. Yeah, they do a great job. It's this is great design on a not expensive vehicle. That means good design can happen on inexpensive products. That's what I love about Mazdas mm -hmm. and and a lot of things. You see expensive vehicles going paint trips and badly executed shut lines and what is this hand built like yep. what the heck's going on here <laughs> tesla <Yeah. laughs> what well that's that's the industry absolutely. like whipping boy of this like I know, I absolutely know. Like, low hanging yeah. fruit but... hasn't stopped sales at all they've slowed though yeah. i suppose but if i mean talking EVs, i'm gonna tell you to go buy a tesla because of range i just yeah. am. and infrastructure yes Yes. But, yeah, I mean, like the thing that people always forget about cars and especially when the conversation gets heated and <laughs> opinionated is that about? car companies exist to make money. They are businesses. They don't exist to tailor to- They are not charity organizations. Right. They don't exist to, you know, make something specific for you. 
the mm-hmm. small portion of the group of the world that is interested in this. Like they exist to put money in the pockets of the shareholders and the, you know, administrators and, and everybody on the board. And that's yep. really it. Yep. So can we talk about Cybertruck then from a design element? Gosh, you know, I admit that that has grown on me and I can't quite articulate why, but I suppose it's because of throwing all design norms out and okay. throwing caution to the wind, which is also kind of appealing from a design perspective, a- approaching it with a deconstructivist attitude and throwing out all the established norms mm-hmm. usually can elicit in anything, cars, products, filmmaking, music, you throw out all the established conventions and then suddenly that is the new convention. That makes sense. I'm not saying that this is a beautiful design, but I'm saying that that throws everything out and it tossed everybody out on their ear and went, wait, you can do that? You can put a shot of espresso in your morning coffee? That's that's legal? Right. Wait, uh, fully support that. (laughs) I didn't know you could even do that. Sign me up. So I, I, it appeals to me from the throwing everybody out and going against the grain kind of thinking, but from a design standpoint, no, I, I don't feel like the surfaces are particularly beautiful. On the other hand, if you're building it out of stainless steel, all you can make is a barbecue. You're not shaping that stainless steel. It's, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. too thick. It's too strong. You can't, I mean, the most you can make is a sink and, and even <laughs> then you're stretching the material and so that's what we get. Okay. So you want to use stainless? Okay. Great. That's what your car is going to look like. Hello, DeLoreans. You right. want yeah. to use stainless yeah, steel? That's about as far as we can go. What I do wonder the, what car has the most right. surfaces of any car. Like like an LC500 maybe has the most mm. happening in one individual panel. Mm. Yeah, possibly. The most going on would be a Celine S7. Oh boy, yeah. 94 openings on that car. 94? What? Remember all the... Yeah. Ubers? And as I'm looking at images here, yeah. Count them. <laughs> I, I can't. You don't want to. <laughs> you don't want there's, to. What was the engine in that? Was it a GM engine? Was it a Corvette engine? I don't remember. Oh, man. That thing. Yeah. Still... There's a lot of openings on that car. So other than the like just the five across the front, six, seven, and then <laughs> you've got another four-ish? Keep going. <laughs> plus two, plus another four. <laughs> like that's just plus one the back. side. Yeah. Plus then there's all these up here above each wheel well. Like it looks like an LMP one car with the opening above yeah. the wheel. Like, yeah, I never like these things. I never like louvers and mm. slats and except for test rooms, of course. But you know. this is yeah, it's the nineties epitomized in uh, exactly. In design, those wheels are also heinous on that car. <laughs> well, like, there's not really a good angle of the vehicle. Yeah, there's no money shot. Here we got, I... we got, we got friend of the show Doug standing over one too. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> look, at, look at all the fins and grooves and yeah. So, oh my god, those are the same wheels. Those were the factory wheels good god yeah it looks, yeah, yeah. looks like an nsx that got porsche gt1 and then thrown in the washing machine see again here you can get away with no door handle because it's tucked under that that shoulder line yeah hmm. if you put see, something Ross... ugly on there it'd be like it'd ruin the design i mean the design's ruined anyway but you know <laughs> <laughs> so i had a weird thought today and it's just because i drove by a bunch oh, of uh kia or no hyundai konas but like I feel like Hyundai Kia for America is like weird hatchbacks that Citroen does for Europe. Like the weird- The French like... will always beat us. The French will right. always beat everybody in terms of something quirky and weird. Mm-hmm. It's gotta be something from France. Absolutely. But what's interesting is uh, I've got a good friend, actually a classmate who did all the, the exterior class A surfacing for the Santa Cruz. Okay. Mm-hmm. His name's Terry Chen, and I talked to him I, after it came out. I was like, hey, man, we're driving one. I got one in my driveway, and tell me about those uh, mount points at the top of the fender well. Those are originally designed to flip out where you could mount a GoPro so you could have some, some external mounted camera while you were off-roading hmm. in your Santa Cruz. And that was very much a designer thing. So the, at the top of the, the fender arch on those, you see that little tab. That's what that was for? 
Exactly. If huh. you zoom into that, uh, it's probably on Hyundai's media site, or maybe there's close-up photos of that. Those. Okay. There's a little car icon on on those tabs. The designers wanted those to open, flip out, and that was just a GoPro threaded mount, mm -hmm. so you could mount your GoPros all the way around the car and have cameras going while you off road in this thing. That's so But of course, Hyundai management skewered that because that would have been extra cost and mm -hmm. tooling and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But exactly right. There you go. Wow, that would have been genius. I mean, that, and that's the design student. And Terry was like, dude, we got smashed by management. We wanted to do this, but we couldn't. Mm -hmm. So we just get this little tab and that's all you get. So we just put this little embossed car icon on the tab instead. But that was the original designer thinking. Little tiny things that sort of change the experience. And for off-roading, who else has done that on any vehicle? Toyota on the Tacoma TRD Pro had a GoPro mount on the dashboard, but that was- Okay, so in, internal mount, but nothing external. Inter yeah, 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 no, nothing external. Yeah, you can see where they were designed to flip out. Yeah, and, that's- And mount some sort of camera so you could look down at the <laughs> articulation of the wheel or whatever you're doing rock crawling. I was like, man, what a great idea. I'm sorry, you know, it's another battle lost by, yeah. by uh, management. Too bad, because that would have been a really interesting yeah. thing not only just to see it in practice but to see if santa cruz owners actually used it you know well, the, exactly exactly the marketing team would have <laughs> well, of course <laughs> I mean, would have been done on the press launch and all the all the journalists would have but still yeah. Yeah. you'd have gone question. home with your usb or your micro sd card <laughs> micro. <of> your <laughs> footage i feel like ford's definitely sent me home with footage from an in-car before like that exactly. exactly but yeah i mean designers are always pushing for for new interesting things and that's why i've got friends at, at hyundai and kia and i really appreciate what they're doing it's not for everybody but they're taking the same approach as bmw is to beaver teeth they don't need to sell all those things to everybody mm -hmm. they just need to sell enough of them to make their business case Unfortunately, it took a turn for the ugly for BMW, but I do like a lot of the surfaces Hyundai and Kia are doing. As a whole, sometimes it doesn't mesh. It doesn't gel. It's not a cohesive whole. Mm -hmm. But as if you just, you know, make a, a football upright or a, a you know, a, ca a camera lens with your fingers and look at particular portions of the car and like, wow, that washout of that theme, that line just ends right into the fender and it respects the, on the Elantra and it respects the gas door. Yeah. Fantastic. And why did you use to choose to use a circular shape for the gas door in the Elantra that's in stark contrast to everything else that's going on with the car? Well, it's, it's a familiar shape and it can be ignored by your eye because everybody knows what a circle is. Hmm. So I don't see that. I see the theme. If it's some weird, funky shape, all I'm looking at is the gas door. Mm -hmm. But designers choose that circular theme mm -hmm. to kind of erase it from your mind. You don't see it. You don't think about it. It's a perfect circle. So then how do you explain the enormous oversized gas cap on the Mini? I have a Clubman right now that leaves right. tomorrow. And the, the gas door is like almost you know dinner plate sized. Because of proportion, because the design theme for the Mini is to overemphasize proportions on the car. Mm -hmm. The headlights and the taillights are just a little too big. Have you noticed? Mm -hmm. as, as far as <laughs> what they really need to be, they're just, they don't need to be that size. Mm -hmm. But they are for perception because even mm -hmm. though the car has grown, those elements are oversized that make you think the car is still small. Right. It's the same thing with Ford's new Explorer that they've just released that's sitting on the Volkswagen ID4 MEB platform. Is it? The Is that the Europe the, one? It, it's an ID4 sitting underneath. Europe. It's for Europe only. No way. At yeah. this point. Volkswagen's ID4 underneath with Ford's interface and Ford styling, the the elements, the styling elements make it look like an Explorer size that you see in the States. Mm -hmm. It's tiny. This is actually really small. It's That's so ID4. But the, the overhangs are the dead giveaway. They're short overhangs front and rear. And it gives us some very, uh, you know, blocky kind of brutalist styling that mm -hmm. Ford has become known for that actually really works. I like it. But as far as the proportions, those headlights don't need to be that big. The right. overemphasized wheel arches make it look chunkier and beefier than it really is. Find a photo of that uh, Explorer with a human being next to it. And you'll realize mm. 
this thing's actually kind of tiny. Oh, it's an ID4. Strange. That's so interesting. So how do you feel about the new ID buzz, the uh, the electric bus? Yes, the buzz, the bus. I think it's it's a natural evolution. I, okay. I mean, have we gotten the beetle out of our system? Are we all done with the beetle? Can we just leave it in the dustbin of history? Mm. I've never liked the beetle. I didn't like the resurrection from 98. I didn't like it then. Mm. I don't like it now. But this bus, the buzz, is a really excellent natural evolution. And you'll notice that the styling is very minimal. Mm -hmm. It's It can't be more than it is. So what what elements do you have to use on a slab-sided vehicle like this? You have textures and patterns. That's what you can go after. And, and we're seeing Volkswagen execute it. So of Volkswagen's current design language, I feel like that is the best use of their design language. Everything else that that is applied to, every other vehicle, totally boring and un uninteresting. Mm -hmm. there, there's no flavor there. I think Kias and Hyundais have a lot of flavor, whether you like them or you don't but they've got a lot of interesting flavor. They're using a lot of textures too, but yeah. I mean, the body sides alone, I mean, gives some gorgeous reflections. This, <laughs> this is the the point that I'm thinking of is the cactus, the, the, the cactus compared to the Kona right now, I feel is like mm -hmm. the only market we you see get. That? But Have you ever seen bus? inside one of those cacti? No, no. Find an interior photo. It's like, oh okay. yeah, I don't want to grab that. <laughs> Really? The thing about the bus, though, is when it's monotone or like when it's one color, all of a sudden the design language is just gone. They have to be two tone. Yes, yes. Oh, and it, I and it. it actually really works. So I think it's an excellent execution. And they've really capitalized well on making this because it's a big bus and it takes a it's got a huge floor pan so you can put a giant battery in it. It makes all kinds of sense. And it's connected to nostalgia like crazy without being retro. Mm. Yes. The I'm not going to lie. I wouldn't mind one to run around town with all four kids in the back. I think oh, it'd be awesome. Yeah. I think we're already great. talking about one. You're yeah, talking about a bus? And it, it doesn't That's matter right. what they drive like. Nobody will care because it's about the, the people actually coming up to you like, oh my mm -hmm. gosh, I used to have one or I've always loved these or whatever. That's what it's about. It has nothing to do with how it drives. If it drives the same as every other electric vehicle, it yeah. will be a success. It, It'll it be a will. success even if it doesn't. Yeah. I found, I found the cactus interior. The cactus <laughs> interior is not that bad. Well, it's very but, interesting though for what it is though. Like The steering <laughs> wheel, the airbag not being centered on a steering wheel though, like with there being more wheel below, that, that would bother the hell out of me. It's uh, it's funky. It's it's interesting. It's, it's definitely different. different. Yeah, luggage handles on the doors, little mm -hmm. cactus patterns on the doors there. Just Textures so weird. Yeah. I dig it. I like it actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like it in those tones. I was expecting something a little more in your face. I like it for somebody else to own. Yes. Well, it's a French car. I don't want to own it. I just yeah, I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> when they're when they're rolling past you, you're like, that's a cactus. Nope. No year new. after year rumors of them coming back to the states and yet here we are that's funny talking about <laughs> I, it from afar i want someone to safari uh an sm oh really that's uh, what i want to see best riding safari car well ever. with the just turn the air suspension up to the fullest of the <laughs> exactly highest, you've got it <laughs> like the lexus ahc just flick it to full ride height and yeah. let it ride exactly <laughs> that would be great it would be like a uh like a French AMZ Eagle 4x4. Yeah. <laughs> this one's this one literally has Safari in the name as DS. There you go. It's a DS Safari Estate. <laughs> oh, interesting and cool. That looks like it could be amphibious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is or awesome. sprout wings and a propeller out the back, <laughs> like a chitty chitty bang bang. Like <laughs> oh my god. I haven't seen that movie in 25 years and I'm not mad about that. That's a hundred and whatever episodes, and I'm gonna pull out the first chitty chitty bang bang <laughs> reference. <laughs> oh man. That's awesome. All right. Diverting away from that movie. So Paul, what's in uh, your garage? I've currently got the 2015 Cayman GTS. I'm a Porsche super freak. When I tell people what I do. Say, so I'm, I'm not your regular old car enthusiast. I'm a super freak and I love it. <laughs> and I've got the 928. Todd and I just finished uh, November 2022, our final road trip down to Texas. 
and drove our cars the past down there. And I think Todd's really thinking about selling the Z car. Really? Uh, you know, just, yeah, he loves that thing, but uh, he, he's, I, I think he's had the time with it and we've commemor commemorated them with road trips. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, unless somebody offers me crazy money for the 928, that's, that's my jam. I really love that car. So this was at uh, the Color Cartel studio in Austin and they, uh, they hosted us there, did a little graffiti art on the wall there, painted over with white paint and did some graffiti art and uh, nice. welcomed us there. So that was a lot of fun. So I got awesome. those two uh, Porsches and the Expedition, my 2012 Expedition EL. Which Ooh, engine. Is that the maroon one? It is. It is. Uh, my dad owned this and he is no longer able to drive. And I wanted to keep in the family because we had so many family memories in this thing. And it's been all mm -hmm. over Alaska, all over the U.S. It's held dogs and cellos and kids and people. And it moved me out from California to Utah. And it's you know, got a special place and I use it as a production vehicle. This is, yeah, I would say understand. this is the chase truck. Yep. Yep. That's, this is the so, gear truck. This is what we do. A lot of follow footage. It's excellent. It's just fantastic. It's, it's bomb proof. I put winter tires on this thing and even in two wheel drive around here, the, I, it's just unstoppable. Dude, bronze mm -hmm. methods look so good on it. Yeah. I love like maroon. On burgundy. Yeah. Mar so is it a five, four? It's a five four Triton. Okay, yeah, you bet. I'll, so I'll keep how, kicking forever. Have you run into any issues with spark plugs? Oh no, that's the four six. Uh, no, it's the five four or two. <laughs> is it really? I have oh, not. Yeah. I changed. Uh, I changed out my own spark plugs uh, in twenty twenty one. Put iridiums in, and it's just it's smooth. It's smoother than a mayonnaise sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. Years ago, when before we got the suburban we have now, we were we were looking at the extended expeditions, the ELs, before they went to the ego boosts, okay. and that was the thing that kept coming up: is the spark plugs would like break off like halfway in, halfway out, and you had oh, to get really? a specialty tool to like get them fully yeah, removed. That was something on the four six Mustangs too, forever. No kidding, I didn't realize that. I bought all those you know little bendy arm things that. <laughs> The, the cam tool just to get down in there. And I finally got it done, got all, all of them replaced. So nice. So, sounds yeah, like she, deferred maintenance problems. She, she runs good. Yes. It does sound like a deferred maintenance thing. It's something if you, if you hadn't, weren't doing them at the normal intervals. So yeah. I'm hoping she runs a long time to tie into the sentimental value story. So in 2004, my dad ordered Chevy Avalanche. Okay. Oh God! And, <laughs> and I know the pickup Todd's... truck that plays pickup truck on TV. I'm not oh, a real one. man. Well, that we play one did, on TV. We did more with that more pickup truck stuff with that truck than most people do with every pickup truck they'll ever own. That's, funny. That's a suburban so, underneath, isn't it? It is a suburban underneath. So rides like suburban has an eight foot bed when you want it, and it was so. Anyways, and I know uh, I know Todd's dad had a, at least one of them, didn't he? Yeah. So he ordered it from the factory. It arrived. Not entirely the way that it was supposed to have arrived after it got lost on a train between Texas and New York for, you know, like three, three or four weeks. Um, so my dad drove it for five years and then I inherited it. Okay. I drove it for six or seven years and then gave it to my brother in a swap. My brother sold it to one of my best friends. <laughs> who has been driving it for probably like four years, five years. Um, and he is now selling it back to my brother. It, it has, Village bicycle. Yes. But it, it's the same thing. It's the sentiment. Like he doesn't need it. You know, he, yeah. does, he did, drives a forerunner every day, but it's, it's the sentimental value. And it's like, it's either going to go get traded in and disappear forever or for 1500 bucks, it can stay around and, you know, be the backup vehicle for when something else is broken. I Dude. totally hear it. It's it's excellent for being around Park City. And when I have family visit, you know, just fill it full of skis and gear and we mm -hmm. use it as a production truck. But yeah, oh, there it is. That is the truck. Yeah. 250. It's got forever 250 to find. <laughs> yeah, that that is uh that is a picture of my one of my best friends who owns it now took at the hospital in my city where he works. Wow. Uh, yeah. And those are fun fact. Yeah. See, like, and uh, given he has a C5 Corvette with a ton of modifications and is one of the most 
obsessive people I know when it comes to keeping vehicles clean. If not seats look amazing. He is, (laughs) I think if he could become anybody professionally, it would be Larry Casilla. Okay. But yeah, he's taken amazing care of it. And and it it actually has, those are Tahoe Z71 wheels from Mm -hmm. the same year, but it's coming back. still, it's got it's a immaculate tune. It, it's been tuned by a guy that does like, you know, big time Corvette tuning, who's also tuned my buddy Dom's Corvette and yeah, it's coming back around. So it gets great mileage is what I'm hearing. Uh, he <laughs> with that gets, 93 tune. <laughs> and then I, I think he gets like 14 or 15, which so is. So he's not quite down to your level is what I'm hearing. Like it's seven in the Escalade. Not in the Escalade. No, no. <laughs> Uh, See, I want a supercharger on the expedition, but I can't justify spending money on that thing until I get a new transmission transaxle for the 928. And then I, you know, a list of other things to spend money on, like a mountain bike and all this stuff. Right. But still, I want a supercharger for that thing. If I'm going to get bad gas mileage, I want power to go along with that bad. Oh, mileage. yeah. I, I, I own a Lexus GX. So I know the, there you go, the trade off of little power and bad gas mileage. I, I know exactly what I want to do. I want to, just supercharger plop that thing on i i don't think it'll stress that motor out too much i i don't want you know just a little bit of boost it doesn't have to be a lot just you know 80 extra horsepower 100 extra horsepower whatever just a I, little bit oh, so, uh, yeah just i hope they do um i saw a meme recently for uh forerunners and it was like v6 reliability four cylinder powered v8 gas mileage mm-hmm. perfect uh, there is, <laughs> yes. in fact, a supercharger you can get for the fifth gen four runners, and it makes 400 horsepower with the supercharger. Yeah, I mean, I don't it's want that. a little bit more of a stressed out engine at that point, but okay. Yeah. It's so I silly. Just, it's, I, get like I don't want that chaos. In the expo, and I, I want power to go along with it. Yeah. So, yeah, plus I'm at altitude. So we're 6,400 feet. I say. So I want, uh, you know, that 310 horsepower engine is now like probably 260 or 250. <laughs> <laughs> Do you notice huge differences on like in the 928 when you go from altitude down to the plains? Can you actually tell like a discernible difference? Yeah. See, and then we come out East coast out your way and we mm-hmm. put 93 in it Ooh. and it just wakes that thing right up. It's delicious. Yeah. I don't know if you remember, but I was actually supposed to drive the 86 on the East coast yes. the trip. Yes. And then, you know, had life. a very pregnant wife and and does flows plants went to the wayside. But yeah, <laughs> we, right. we got we got the good juice out here. Yeah, you do. You can find it. Yeah. I, I introduced my brother in law to 85 the other day and he's like, what is this? And I go, oh, it's Colorado. It's just you just we do. wash out the wine glasses with it. <laughs> right. Which that okay, so we may have been GX shopping also and the talk of always putting premium in it like <sighs> It's <laughs> it depends on what state you're in. Like kinda. So like I don't I don't have the, to go by 91 because when I'm in Colorado, 89 is all I'm gonna get. The interesting thing about this debate is that by the book, Lexus says you use premium. They define yes. that as 91 or higher. Right. However, that engine, aside from minor, minor, minor changes to the ECU for knock detection, is sold exactly the same around the world where 85 is the best they have so you can and will have effectively zero problem whatsoever running 87 or 89 in it it's just where are you cutting the money you know like you're gonna get a little worse gas mileage yep but it's saving you you know three dollars a fill-up i mean i'm already prices lately three dollars a fill-up <laughs> i mean i don't know i i've put five thousand miles on the lexus in you know in 18 months so okay that's right uh, yeah yeah it, the, the expo is 120 home. to fill that thing 28 gallon tank oh yeah the 28 oh it's good. fantastic yeah yep. how much did you say 120 bucks to fill it for 20 it's 28 gallon tank Oh, that's right. You're in Park City. Sorry, I was like, wait, wait a minute. I'm filling. Yeah. I'm filling the 32 gallon suburban for like 60 bucks over here. Yeah, so like... right. Yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. we're in a ski resort town too. Yeah, yeah. I, I I just did copper. It was like 
four oh nine a gallon. Yeah, that makes okay, sense. Okay, I'd gladly take four oh nine. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, at three nineteen over here. Hmm. Yeah, I'm sure I'm getting some blow by in those piston rings. I've got hundred and forty thousand miles on it uh, at this point, and I'm sure I'm getting blow by. It's using some oil, but you know what? I just keep the oil topped up and change regularly, and she just runs great. Mm -hmm. Well, you're a pro with rebuilds now after the little Porsche totally. Let's go. Just bring them on. <laughs> yeah. That that um, evolved quickly, didn't it? It was like, uh, yeah, let's see, and then suddenly, motors. Yeah, out. yeah, yeah. I ordered <laughs> all the parts, but I will say I fired it up in late January when we had a clear, dry but cold day, top to life, ready to rock. It's just the transaxle needs rebuilding or replacing, but still, mm. the engine fired right up. It's been sitting for two or three months in the cold and she's ready to go. So that made me feel really good that, you know, this crazy old, you know, super complex Porsche, it's ready to rock. So, yeah. yeah. I'm, Do that. I'm just going to stick that around. Have felt good. I, I had a Kawasaki ATV that I did a bunch of engine stuff to, and it was always a relief when it started. <laughs> like, <laughs> not just after working on it, but after. Every time I started it, it was always a relief. But that, that was a carburetor. That was voodoo magic. That's right. That's right. Was that four-stroke? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was a 650 V-twin. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice. God. Well, sweet. Ross, you want to start wrapping things up? You want me to Yeah. Do yeah. So, Paul, why don't you tell us what you guys got coming up? <laughs> Cross buttons. Uh, <laughs> well, we are planning more road trips. We've really fallen in love with road trips after this uh, Cars of the Past series. We have not yet announced the cars that we're going to be doing yet. Uh, things are still a little bit pending, but we've got the plan and uh, things are set in motion. And we, we still really like experiencing roads and just getting out and driving and kind of putting our money where our mouth is. We did that with the GR86 for a year. You know, we bought a manual transmission sports car and mm -hmm. thrashed the hell out of it. So we were, we like that. That has now left our lives. It went to a fan of the show and he's been driving it like crazy, which is great. And so we're going to be definitely doing more road trips and continuing the test drive channel and really focusing on both our YouTube channels this year, as well as the podcast. But yeah, we've got uh, a lot of interesting comparisons and we've become known for that. I think you guys know, know us for that too. So whether it's a two or three car comparison, we want to talk about back to back. If you're shopping for this car, you might already know what you're buying. You might already right. know that that is your car. Nothing else matters. If you're getting a Corvette C8, you're getting a Corvette C8. You oh, yeah. can't be talked into anything else. That is fine. But what about these other competitors? What about something else on on the horizon or you know on the radar so we're always putting together two or three car comparisons for our main channel and then uh more you know single test drives you know various press cars suvs evs that kind of thing for the test drive channel that's so great cool we're definitely looking forward to uh to doing a lot and then of course as i mentioned before our two u.s meetups uh colorado trip is out there we've already about halfway sold out on that and uh, then our pilgrimage trip to Spa Francorchamps and the Nürburgring Nordschleife. That's uh, 10 people we're, are going this year. And we're just, I'm just excited to be going back every year. It's, mm -hmm. it's just so delightful to go. So, yep, there you go. If uh, you go to everydaydriver.com, the adventures tab, the Rocky Mountain Adventure in Colorado is still available. It's a bit more expensive, but like I said before, it's spouse friendly. Take a friend, take a spouse, take your significant other and join us like-minded people that just love to get out and drive. So that is, uh, that's something we love. And it's, it's become very organic, especially the pilgrimage trip. When we created that film in 2015, I was on a business trip because I was still working in the software industry on a business trip in Berlin and realized that the Nordschleife was only five hours away. So I grabbed a coworker, we rented a Seat and it was still on winter tires. And we drove five hours down to the Nordschleife Amazing. and took that thing on the Nürburgring <laughs> on winters. And it was awesome. And then uh, Todd came over. Uh, I was like, hey, man, let's just 
to shoot a film of us experiencing this. And people said, hey, I'd join you if you ever guys, guys ever went back. So we're looking at expanding in the future and doing other road trips in other countries and, and definitely some other track driving. But we love doing this, uh, this original trip and uh, people love going. So yeah, put it on your, on your bucket list. It's uh, not cheap, but I think very mm. worth it. So I, uh, I'm, I feel like I'm uh, sacrilegious in that like, I don't really want to drive on the Nürburgring, but spa. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And Ron Simons has planted a seed and he has claimed Portimao is better than spa. Really? Oh, I have yet to take him up on Portimao, which I want to go. That is also uh, on the F1 calendar, mm -hmm. but still, I love spa. It's just, it's like home. Being there is just like, I'm home. Yeah. It's great. I love all the corners. I love studying them, love improving and, and uh, just getting better every time we go back. So, and they wow. changed a rouge this year. There was, a uh, they didn't, minor... well, they changed a rouge in, uh, they moved that wall. They brought the, yeah. Going on the uphill uh, as you go to the right, they move the left back where Leno yeah, they, had they a move that nice back quite a bit crash because, last year. Uh, that's of course where Stefan Beloff is known to have uh, killed himself at high speed into that wall, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. we're reminded that every year. But uh, yeah, a lot of improvements to the track, and uh, yeah, just constantly learning new lines and and uh, yeah, tons Portimao of looks interesting. Portimao is uh, yeah, from what I understand, that uh, straightaway you can see is elevated quite a bit yeah like it comes it up and like comes it, down right and then drops down yeah hmm. so you're under hard braking under full compression on turn one right hmm. there yeah you guys should come do lime rock <laughs> i'd love to we need to do more track driving in the u.s for sure well and i i said last show i'm i'm going back to road america in the spring so are you nice yes nice. the glory of the midwest auto media association mama. events there <laughs> mama my mama lets me go to red america <laughs> <laughs> thanks robbie <laughs> dude that's my roommate <laughs> I, know, I, know. I wouldn't yeah. go if it wasn't robbie. right <laughs> <laughs> Well, sweet. Oh, I'm going to wrap man. up the show real fast. Uh, you can rate and review wherever you listen to podcasts. I know last time uh, when I was just Ross and I, I asked if you uh, listen to the show somewhere else, but you do have a Spotify account, go ahead and click that follow button on Spotify. Uh, Spotify like now reports listeners to you and you can we can use that to hopefully get us paid a little bit for this. <laughs> uh, you can like and subscribe on YouTube as well. And for Paul, it's everyday driver everywhere, right? Pretty much at every social media that you can think of, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and certainly YouTube slash Everyday Driver. And then our Test Drive channel is youtube.com slash Test Drive Videos. Nice. Cool. Uh, and then you're still on Prime. Still on Prime as well. All of our TV episodes are up there. We're not focused on TV uh, as much. Like I said, we're just focused on our two YouTube channels and uh, we're not beholden to the 21 minutes, 15 frames of a TV episode. <laughs> so we can kind of flex a little bit and let, let our breathe. episodes run a little long. Yep. Yeah, that's fantastic. Good. Uh, for us, you can follow Hooniverse, the Hooniverse on Twitter, the real Hooniverse on Instagram. Ross is no, not like the one from Friends and I'm Overlanding Dad and we did a show. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks guys for having me on. Really nice chatting with you.